Okay, we should be live here with, with session 11 at the, the Educator Collaborative Saturday Gathering. And this is called Wonderful Investigations with Mentor Authors and Mentor Texts. My name is Brian Sweeney. I'm, the, the, I'm a consultant for the, the Educator Collaborative, but I'm, I'm going to be the, the tech person helping out here today. And it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters. The first presenter is uh, Joellen McCarthy. And I'm going to introduce her because she's our book ambassador. And her, her special guest here is an author. And I want her to introduce the author. Uh, because as our book ambassador, that's really her job. And I thought what I'd do is talk a little bit about what a book ambassador is for the Educator Collaborative. Really what we've done is we've chosen a person who doesn't just love books, which we all do, that's why we're here, but someone who is an expert at sharing what's kind of current and, and best loved at the time and, and really worth sharing with your classes and with your students. And Jo Ellen, McCur jo Ellen McCarthy is that person for us. She has more than 20 years of, of education experience under her belt. She has degrees from multiple universities. She works with multiple districts and she presents at multiple conferences. And she's here with us today to talk about her work and to talk with uh, Marissa Moss about her work. So here's Joellen and here's their session. Please enjoy. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Um, Brian did share with you that I'm the book ambassador, but I am also a learner, lead learner, um, as I like to say, and I spend every day learning with the teachers and the students that I work with. Um, I also am a proud Nerdy Book Club member, which I think is helpful when you're a book ambassador, and I truly believe that authors are rock stars. So in, um, in my travels, attending conferences, which I believe to be, um, I call those conferences literacy Super Bowls, and um, I had the pleasure of meeting Marissa Moss uh, with colleagues. I was with my colleague Erica Peccarelli and Dave Schultz and we attended a session going back now probably I think that must have been four or five years ago Marissa. Yeah I think um, so. Yeah, and so um, in you know typical nerdy fashion, introduced myself to Marissa and was so impressed. And many of you will know Marissa um, as the author of Amelia's Notebooks. She's fairly well known for that and has published over 50 picture books um, and so many in the series. And actually, this year is the 20th anniversary of Amelia, so congratulations to Marissa. But um, what I learned on the day that we met is that Marissa, um, and I knew also, is that she is a fabulous nonfiction mentor author and she has a tremendous amount of picture books biographies about famous people and really interesting stories to tell and I was intrigued as was my colleague to speak with her about her process and so since then we've actually brought Marissa into classrooms through Skype and had the opportunity to share her work and to share what it means um, having her as the mentor author and the mentor text in the classroom so we're going to talk a lot about her investigation process and how that translates to work with kids and I guarantee you you are in for a treat because I always say Marissa is so brilliant that when she speaks I don't want to do anything else but just stop and write it down I'm like oh it's a Marissa-ism so I get a little <laughs> excited but it's true and I hope that you enjoy meeting Marissa and um, I'm gonna just put up a slide with the, several of her books so that you know and see exactly why um, she is so popular with um, in terms of the biographies. And Marissa, do you want to start speaking a little bit and you can introduce yourself as well? Sure. I wanted to, since it is the, I know we're going to talk a lot about historical research and those sources, but I want to talk a little bit first because it is the 20th anniversary of Amelia's Notebook about the notebooks and why I think they are still great models for inspiring kids to write because when I first did Amelia's Notebook, I mean, it looks like a kid wrote it. The, the things she lives and experiences are completely ordinary kid stuff. She's not a star athlete. She's not an amazing um, actress or singer or particularly talented. She's just a regular kid. And she shows in her books, basically in her notebooks, a way of writing and drawing that any kid can access. And I was recently at a, a young writer's celebration um, where they were presenting the awards and a teacher came up to me afterwards and told me that she had heard me speak years ago and I one of the things I had talked about is the different narrative strategies you can have in a notebook and she said that what she took away from that was that you can be messy it's okay to be messy because Amelia writes in the margins she writes all over the place she writes in words when she's thinking in words in pictures when she's thinking in pictures and that gave the teacher permission to work that way with her students and she had one student who's a boy who 
was always writing the margins and she'd been coming down hard on him and wanting him to write in nice neat paragraphs and after she heard me talk it freed her she said it basically gave her the permission to just encourage him which dramatically changed his writing he became a really good writer and she felt like she was a better teacher for him so I'm hoping the notebooks still do that for kids and for teachers show them other ways of thinking and writing because we all have different styles of thinking and writing is thinking and just empowering your kids to do what works best for them I love that um, and I just put up a slide to share some of the examples from Amelia's notebooks and in fact one of my favorite things about Marissa is she references that all the time about being messy and taking risks and giving kids an opportunity to see what's possible so yeah we're absolutely going to discuss um, just keeping a notebook and, and what writers do which is observing the world around them and ask questions and wonder and you know we'll, we'll also pair some text with Wonderopolis because that's a fabulous resource that um, I use very often often in the classroom and it's important to ask questions and to know what our kids are thinking. We want our kids to ask questions. Um, it's about questions. I know in Chris's book um, in Energizing Research, Reading and Writing, which I actually have in my pile of professional books on the side, he says that investigation starts with I and it's so important that we figure out what our kids are passionate about and then we tap into that, their curiosities and their passions and what they want to learn and investigate because that brings joy into the learning. So we're really excited about um, presenting together and sharing some of her process and her work. But we also hope that you will participate with us today as well. And we would like you to use the hashtag, which is the EdCollab Gathering, with the number 11. So if you could do that, that would be terrific. And we um, also have two book giveaways, signed books, which you'll hear about those books today. One is Sky High um, by Marissa, and the other is Barbed Wire Baseball, which is actually fascinating, the nonfiction picture book biography of um, the real uh, or an, an Japanese American who played baseball. And I'll let Marissa fill you in later, but I just wanted to encourage you to tweet today with that hashtag, number 11, and we'll have two lucky winners who get signed copies of Marissa's books. Yay! <laughs> Um, so I'm going to put this slide share up again just to show a picture and again talk a little bit about how we can bounce back and forth between Marissa's work and the process that she uses as a writer and how that impacts our students. So ultimately we want our kids to be engaged and excited and we want to empower kids with choices. Choices and voices are what really matters. So this is just a slide um, from one of my districts. Um, I do work through Always Learning and also through the Educator Collaborative and um, I just think this is a, a wonderful literacy snapshot that demonstrates you know that we have to think about the passion and the interest of all of our students and as um, Reggie Routman says you know unless we reach into our students hearts we have no entry into their minds and so what I love about that picture too it really celebrates a community of learners um, you may not be able to point out exactly in those pictures but the janitor is in that picture the principals are in those pictures sharing books that they love as well as the um, the um, librarians, everyone, everyone is represented in there, including the superintendent. So talk about being a lead learner and really celebrating those choices and voices. I think our kids need to see us modeling that, and so th that's really important. So Marissa, do you want to talk a little bit about? Um, I'll put the slide back up that helps you with what you said about in pictures and in words and thinking about that. Is this the Amelia slide? Uh, yeah, I actually. <laughs> sorry, no. It's I, actually, I don't know what you're putting up. I'm having to talk about anything, but um. If we're talking about the notebooks again, I mean, a lot of the aspect of getting kids interested in engaging their hearts and their minds is allowing them to use all parts of their brain. And kids tend to be visual thinkers. I mean, most kids are better artists than most teachers. And they stop when they're around 9 or 10. They become hypercritical of their drawing. But if you encourage them to keep on drawing, then they have access to a different kind of creativity. So, yes, this, this image of the the head and the heart is basically it's making you think visually and you can section it off and there's a different ways of accessing kids information so that they can think in terms of mind maps and heart maps so it's not just you don't have to write just in a paragraph you don't have to write a narrative you can do different kinds of writing and thinking and drawing because they all inform creativity and getting kids excited about learning reading and writing they all can feed each other and there's not there's kind of this hierarchy we have in our culture that words are better than drawings and I don't think that's true and it's certainly not true for young kids and if you encourage them instead of squashing them then you may end up with better results and I think it's actually it's really exciting this year this past year 
that the Newbery Honor went to a graphic novel. So finally we're validating visual thinking and cartoon making, which is something that a lot of kids like to do and have been told, don't do that, don't do that, that's not, write, not real writing. Well, it is real writing when you win a Newbery for it. So yay, I'm, I'm really thankful to the librarians for choosing that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I actually wanted to talk a little bit too about your process in terms of questioning and curiosity. So I'm just going to throw this um, slide up that if I am not spazzing out, which apparently I am, one second, I apologize. Yeah. Do you see that? Hold on, sorry about that guys. Um, here we go. Um, I love this, you know, the phrase that a picture poses a thousand questions and you can see some of the photographs and maybe Marissa you can talk a little bit about that with those authentic documents. Go ahead. Well, a lot of my work comes out of questions and I think that actually questioning is a great way to get at learning for kids because you, you, if you ask what's behind this image, I mean that image sets off a bunch of questions. So for example, the, the top one, the top left, which is Kenichi Zanimura, who's the hero of barbed wire baseball, the very short person, towered over by Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. I mean, that picture makes you wonder who are these people and how do they get in the situation? And the one below it is actually, you wouldn't know who it is, but it's a woman dressed as a man. Um, she's a spy in the Civil War uh, who was not in the army but was an actress. I mean, we would now say, okay, clearly she's a woman, but nobody thought so at the time, they didn't blink an eye, but you look at this picture and you wonder who is she and what's her story and it's the same for the lower right which is a photograph I came across at a, a museum, of the railroad museum in Sacramento and I saw this picture of these women who are loading freight and they are wearing overalls dressed like men but they have like little lady shoes on and they look so proud and happy and the question I asked was who were these women? I didn't know women were loading freight at the turn of the century. Who were they? How did they get these jobs? What became of them? And that question became an exploration which became a book. I mean all of these photographs basically became explorations and became books. For the one above um, the women loading freight, Sky High, Maggie G, that came out of a, a question from a newspaper story about women who flew planes in World War II and I thought, who were these, again, who were these women? I had no idea. It's a story I felt like needed to be told. And I think kids are natural questioners. They ask these questions, so encourage those questions and then see what comes out of them. Absolutely. I'm going to just stop sharing on there. I wanted to just pull this slide up because you couldn't really see and I think it's a better visual um, just to show that how, how you came across this photograph and what you were thinking because you can clearly identify some of the other people in that picture. Is the, is the Kenichi Zanamura one? Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, this is really a great story because the question, this came out of the question too of, uh, most people know um, ba um, Baseball Saved Us, that picture book about baseball in the internment camps, and my question was, well, who started playing baseball in the internment camps? Somebody must have started that. Who was the person and how did that happen? And that's how I found Kenichi Zanamura, who was a professional baseball player, who played um, exhibition games with Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, which is how this photograph came to be, and who played every position. He was a manager. He was incredibly um, well known in his sport. And when he was interned with his family, the way he dealt with being in this incredibly depressing place was to build his field of dreams. And he created these teams, which was the only time that they could leave the internment camps was to play other teams from other camps and local teams. And he picked, of course, this baseball is the most American sport of all. He was claiming his Americanness and also claiming who he was in the most emphatic way through his sport. And uh, this book won an award from the Museum of Tolerance and when I was there for the ceremony they had groups of fifth grade classes who had done reports on it. And what I was amazed by was how kids really got the message of this book in a way that I thought I didn't even realize was out there. So you, the moral of that story is you know, never underestimate kids because one boy said what he learned from barbed wire baseball was no one can put you in prison except yourself. I'm like that is so profound. I mean kids get these things and you just cannot underestimate kids. It's one reason why I love writing for kids. Adults, you know, I'm not so sure about, but kids, <laughs> they get it. I mean, they really are really critical readers and basically all you have to do is encourage what they innately are doing anyway. They're highly critical. I just encourage them to articulate it. Absolutely. I'm trying to see. I told you, Marissa, everything she says, I want to tweet. So I'm trying to tweet at the same time. So <laughs> friends out there, if you're watching, can you please tweet with the Ed Collab Gathering hashtag number 11 so that I can not multitask as much um, and give all my... You're a master at it. 
<laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. Um, but Marissa said something really important, and I think that you know students can be more critical readers, um, you know, just when they also think and unpack what a mentor author has done and think about and ask questions not only of the subject matter, but the process. And so it's it's not just you know understanding the craft lessons, but it's understanding the process with which an author comes to investigate something. And then how can we take that into their own work and into their own writing? So um, I'm a big fan of using text sets and reading ladders, and that's a little shout out to um, Terry Lassane at Professor Nana, um, which is a great professional resource book called Reading Ladders. And it's you know it's about meeting kids where they are and bringing kids to where you need them to be. So many people think about oh picture books and you know we try to gear this to, to a conversation for older uh, students specifically because you know we're, we're preaching to the choir when we say at the elementary level that you know we need to use picture books but picture books are so powerful they're a valuable resource and you know I think Don Gray said something about picture books or, or poetry being big thinking in small packages and it's really important that we think about that because we have an opportunity to model and to think aloud and to take out pieces of text language and word choice and you know as Chris and Kate's book talk about in close reading, finding a lens and thinking about that and setting a purpose for our kids and what is it do we want them to see and then to emulate. And in, in my opinion, we want them to emulate other teachers and other authors and, and writers and other students who are curious, who are wonderers, who ask questions and then go out and seek that information and, and also to you know create arguments around the information and the data that they collect and put a spin on because their stories are important. So I actually have um, an image that I want to share and I don't think I have slits. Um, share screen share. I forget that step every time. So sorry. Um, but this is just a little synopsis of a text set where, um, and I'll, I tweeted out some samples of some wonderings and some pairings. But so here's Marissa's book, Barbara Baseball, which, as you know, is the nonfiction story of this Japanese American who was in an internment camp. Um, but there's a fabulous poem that I have to say as a learner I first was introduced to by Laura Robb who I love Laura so shout out to Laura Robb's work but she shared a poem that was called in response to executive order um, by uh, Dwight Okita and it came from variety of collections. I've already tweeted out the link if, if you're looking for it, but um, you know, getting kids to think about connecting and, and reading across ideas and thinking about poetry and not thinking about poetry just in the month of April because poetry matters all year long and so you can layer opportunities for thinking with poems, with picture books, with um, primary sources and really give kids an opportunity to, to think more deeply and I think that's what is so powerful in using picture books and mentor authors like so. Well, I want to really second what you say about using picture books with older kids because I think there's a tendency to shove kids away from picture books thinking that they're less than, but you can get at some really big themes through a picture book and it's just how you present it. So if you take barbed wire baseball and you ask kids, well, what are the themes of this book? Not just imprisonment, but why did Kenichi, one of the, the, the tropes of the book is that his sons keep on asking, is it done yet? Is it done yet? Is it done yet? As they keep on making this field and it's it's never done until it's absolutely perfect. And you could ask kids, what was he striving for? Or have them ask, they could ask questions about what they think he was striving for. What, do they, what, what questions have come up in their minds as they see this person doing this to such an extreme? So what is it? What is it that's going on here? And I think they get those themes when it's in a picture book. You kind of have a small package that's deep. When you, you a novel I think of is baggier. It's got a lot of room for stuff. So in some ways, you may not notice it's not crystallized, but in a picture book you can really get at big issues. So the big issues of what is the emotional journey that Kenichi Zinnamore takes and where does he bring everybody else and where do you go as a reader? Kids get it. So all you have to do is in your 32 page picture book or 40 page picture book, you have big messages that they can hang on to and then write about and explore. So it's a really great support that should not be you know, minimized because it's not a lot of pages. I mean I think we tend to think oh more pages means better, smarter, you're learning more and that's not necessarily true it's what right. you do with what you have and like you say you're unpacking this kind of density that you get with picture books and poetry absolutely um, 
I actually love, 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 um, and, and I'm spending a lot of time talking about Marissa's work because, again, everything that she does, we can um, take back to our students and share, and, and whether she's physically there or not, um, and that's why I think it's so great having the books because I feel like the books are my co-teachers. So every classroom that I go into, I say, oh, today I'm, you know, bringing Marissa with us because I want to talk a little bit about, you know, some things that I learned from Marissa and what she does, and, and one of the things that Marissa does, which she does so beautifully, is she keeps this collection of information um, in the back in her author's notes that explain exactly where she got the idea. And so even that has been an opportunity for the collaboration and the work that I do with kids. So after they're doing research that they're really invested in and they're passionate about, they have an opportunity to then create author's notes in the same way and really give the reader um, an insight into their thinking. And I think that's a, a huge part of the process. It's not about just creating products. It's celebrating the process that goes into that work. So um, I don't know if you want to add to that, Marissa. Well, I'm a big fan of author notes, and it's interesting as I work as an editor too. I mean, a lot of the, the, the what goes in the book is the story, but there's the story behind the story that if you put it in the book, it it slows it down, it breaks it. You can't. It's not the right place for it. But the perfect place is the author's notes. So a lot of that stuff that you think is you're really excited about, and you're jazzed about, but doesn't belong in the story, stick it in the author's note. So I spend a lot of time on my author's notes. I'm glad to know you actually read them and <laughs> use them for something. I mean, I, I write them for myself because it's just the stuff I'm really excited about but can't quite fit in. Um, but they are a huge part of the journey because every you're looking at a 40-page picture book, but you don't know that I've read hundreds of books that got condensed into that one book. And there's another little small slice that goes into the author's note, uh, which I think I think is when I tell this to kids, they're always like, "Oh my gosh, you read so much. That's daunting." But at the same time, it gives them a sense of this kind of bigger world that you bring in to them for them. Absolutely. And then you're modeling for kids exactly what we want them to do. We want them to read a lot and we want them to write and we want right. them to be engaged and to be on a journey, you know, seeking out things that are, you know, what they want, what they're passionate about. And it's a win-win, um, you know, to balance those things. So I think that's great. I want to put up a slide that um, is from one of Marissa's books and, and I want to ask, um, and, I'm, and I'm hoping people would actually respond and interact. How many people know who Harriet Quimby was? And I know it's Nobody. really not live interacting. Let's see, maybe Brian will get somebody who tweets for us. Is there anyone who knows who Harriet Quimby is out there? You can hashtag the Ed Collab Gathering number 11. I don't know how live, live that would be, but... Um, yeah, but you get a small response because nobody's heard of her, sadly. I know. So, Marissa, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. And I want to just pull out the book right here, Brave Harriet, which is um, all about Harriet Quimby. And maybe you can share a little bit about um, this fine woman who many people well, do, do not know about. Do not know. Because you said I read about famous people. But, in fact, I don't. I read about no. people who should be famous and heroes. Are. So, heroes, yeah, right. she's an, So, she's an example. I mean, Harriet Quimby is you know, an aviation, um, uh, you know, she's kind of a, she's a forerunner way before Amelia Earhart, who everybody's heard of her, but Amelia, um, Amelia Earhart was in the 30s, Harriet Quimby's in the, in the early 1900s, and this is when airplanes were like big box kites, and she was one of the first women to get a pilot's license, and she is the first woman who crossed the English Channel, and like I say, this was early, early, early in aviation history, and she, um, when you, if you, you were flying with just a compass, and if you were off by a couple of degrees, you were off over the North Sea, and you were never heard from again. Um, so she was taking huge risks and was an incredibly brave person. And um, she's not well known because, although she was a, a reporter at the time, and she was writing for the New York Herald, which is the antecedent to the New York Times, and all before her trip, she's writing about the preparations and getting the plane and w waiting for the right weather. The unfortunate thing about her trip is it's timing. Timing is everything, and she happened to land, as that image shows, she lands in Calais on the same day that the news of the Titanic broke. So um, a day after the Titanic sank, sinks, the news comes up, and her story is buried. So as I'm going through newspaper archives, all I see, it's all Titanic all the time. Her story finally appears months later at the very back page of a newspaper in a tiny column. And that's why you don't know about Harry Quimby, because if the Titanic hadn't happened, she would be famous. So I felt like I had to resurrect her story as someone who was taking all these risks and chances uh, very early on and deserves to be better known. And these are the kind of stories I like to find. I like to find the juicy nuggets that history's passed over. And usually these are stories about women or minorities because history is told by 
for the most part, white men. So I'm trying to resurrect that, those histories, and I think those are also stories that relate to kids because not all kids are white boys. So let's tell stories that they can feel connections to, that they feel represents some part of their bigger family story. Absolutely. So you can see why I want to kind of tweet everything Marissa is saying because I'm just right. I love how she said resurrect the stories. I think that's a powerful. <laughs> um, no, I do. I think it's beautiful the way that you said that, and um, you always have me inspired in, in the language that you choose as as you speak and as you know you bring that to life in the stories that you write. So I really appreciate that. Um, I want to share with you something that Marissa has done as well, and I put up. I'm putting up this slide for you. Um, which I said, you know, famous, but I meant exactly what Marissa said, you know, resurrecting <laughs> the stories. Not famous of, at all. <laughs> no, not at all, of heroes and sheroes, which, um, you know, I, I kind of stole that language because there's a book that I love um, that's a poetry book, which is by Patrick J. Patrick Lewis, and it's called Heroes and Sheroes, and in that book, it is um, poems of amazing everyday heroes, and so I kind of stole that language in putting together our session and thinking about what Marissa does in her work, but one of the things that's in this in here and I would love to share is there's a poem in here that one of the everyday heroes is um, elementary teachers and professional teachers and all of that, and that's actually in here, but it says, and this is beautiful, it says, teachers are pathfinders, guides, truth seekers, champions, role models, and guardians. Some of the greatest heroes and sheroes can be found in classrooms. And I know Marissa and I feel that way, um, and are passionate about the work that we do, and, and so, you know, being a teacher, we are um, hopefully all touching the, the hearts and the, and the minds of the students that we work with. So, thank you, Marissa, for that. Um, so, if I go back to this slide, speaking of heroes and sheroes and everyday um, heroes, one of the things that, you know, connecting back to Wonderopolis, there's so many different resources, if you're not familiar with Wonderopolis, where you can just pull up um, a, something your kids are wondering about, you can put it into a little search bar, you can find a topic and they have videos that pair really well with text, but if you're thinking about the idea of these heroes and sheroes, you know, it's, it's not just the Superman or the superpowers, and so Marissa, I think, really has the opportunity and does that so well in finding those um, examples in history and so yes we're speaking a lot about history but the same could be true in, in investigating science or investigating topics uh, in any area so recently and I truly believe that my learning every day happens um, you know on a daily basis through the teachers that I work with and the students but the professional learning network on Twitter is, is amazing and you know just I think it was yesterday the day before Seymour Simon who's really involved on Twitter he said you know good teaching is not driven by answers but by questions and when I shared that with Marissa she said oh I love that because it's so true that it's not just about um, you know teaching it's reading and writing and learning and do you want to say a little bit more about that um, about dri being driven by those questions maybe in your work or in the I mean I think questions drive everything I do I mean that's what every writer is asking these what if questions, but also one of the one of the things that I like to talk to kids about when you talk about asking questions and wondering and everyday heroes and superpowers. I think that that brings me back to people like Maggie G. Um, finding people that you know in your community that you can ask questions of, especially old people, because old people are like living history. And I mean, I'm getting older myself, so I feel like a little <laughs> bit like a little bit, tiny bit of like living history. But I'm talking about people in their 80s. Those people are amazing. They are my heroes and they have lived through some incredible times and it's something I really encourage kids to do and I talk about how I wrote this story about Maggie G in Sky High because she's the only person I've written about who was alive. She's unfortunately died last year but who was alive when I was writing the book and who I could interview and ask questions of and who had a huge amount of material that I could use in writing her story. So this is the kind of person that I use as a model for kids that if they talk to a grandparent or a grandparent's friend or an older friend they know, what they might have in their attic could be telling a ton of stories that they could bring into their own books. So it's basically writing up questions. What kind of questions would you ask this person who grew up at a very different time and maybe in a different country? So you could ask them for their story. How did they get to this country? What did they do? What was it like for them going to school? How did they get their first job? These are questions that really matter. And that's kind of writing down your questions and then presenting them and using them to write your own story. It's kind of teaching them the interview technique that 
I use as a writer when I'm going forward, and even when the person isn't alive, okay, I had Maggie I could ask, I'm asking those questions in my head as I'm writing the book. As I'm reading books and getting research material, part of what I'm doing is figuring out, okay, that part answers that question. Now I have this question that I want to know what kind of food they were eating, what was the weather like, what were they doing, and that all kind of fuels it in to the book. Even if it, you don't write it or spell it out, it's in the back of your head and it sets the scene in your own mind. You know your character better. So it's just all kind of fodder for your writing. There's never too much information. You may not put it all on the page you don't want to, but you need it all inside of you. It's just kind of using your questions as guidelines. So that's kind of both using questions and using heroes. And everyday heroes that you can find in your life, they're there. You just have to ask them. Absolutely. Um, recently in one of the districts that I work in and also as part of um, preparation for a session that I did with my colleague Erica Pecorelli, uh, Marissa and myself, we did that for NCT last year. We talked about um, inquiry notebooks and the investigation process and, and having kids collect from artifacts and real, um, you know, opportunities through the conversations that they have with people that they know, people that they've met, people that they want to know, and then they went out and then used those artifacts to find the stories. And I think that that was a powerful, um, you know, successful way to do some of this research as well because we're giving kids the opportunity of all ages to find things and, and tell the history from their own lives and from their own experience. So I, I do think that, you know, bringing in a book like um, Sky High or Brave Harriet or any of those, and especially because they're so rich with the materials, in the book Sky High, um, for example, in the very last part of the book, because as Marissa said, um, Maggie did keep so many things, there were real authentic photographs from her life, and she found many, many, many examples through that. And so, you know, yes, a picture poses a thousand questions, but it also it allows us to have that opportunity to, to um, you know, get some answers as well and to tell that story. So. Um, I, I do appreciate that, Marissa, because it makes our job as teachers so much easier having the examples that you do. Um, and then when we do that, you know, we're never alone. I think Katie Wood Ray said, you know, that you know, there's no revision without vision. But I think it's just as important to say that there's no anything without the vision, right? We need to show <laughs> kids not really. I mean, you need to be able to see and to have a model, and you need to also write in front of your students with your students and show them that process. So, um, you know, I just love having authors like Marissa um, who we can bring into the classroom, and, and I'll tweet out some other nonfiction kid lit favorites. Um, if we were here to get today all day, I'd love to have them all here. But I, I think that's the beauty of connecting with um, educators and authors on Twitter and the rock star authors that are able to be in our classrooms because it just makes a, a tremendous difference for our students. So I, I appreciate that. Um, one of the slides that we also put in, oops, see I keep going to the slide without <laughs> hitting the slide share. I apologize. Um, I love this. This actually comes from, from Farmingdale and um, Patrick Klosik and I, I appreciate that he shared this with me as well um, after coming to a workshop and a, a literacy forum that uh, we had hosted actually with Tony Sinanis at Kaniag. We do that every year um, for administrators and teachers just kind of celebrating learning and um, what we love about learning and a favorite book that I've used and talked a lot about this year is um, the 10 rules of being a superhero and getting kids to reflect and to think about their everyday heroes and experiences and the superpowers that they have from their own lives and so I just absolutely love that book because I think it really talks about the tips and some of the tips and that I you know really hold on to is that every superhero needs a sidekick and in my opinion Marissa Moss is the perfect example of a sidekick and those books that I have that I bring into the classroom and that we all bring into the classroom those are our sidekicks because they help us be able to reach kids and you know when we figure out what they're into what they like what they're passionate about you know we can have a variety of opportunities to reach those kids instead of having you know one size fits all uh, oh, sorry. That was, you know. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. We have some issues in New York, but um, you know, just being able to have variety and choice, because as you know, choice empowers. So I I appreciate that, Marissa. Um, yeah, because everybody learns differently. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things we were saying, Marissa and I too, even Mrs. Frizzle in her, um, <laughs> in, the, in the magic school bus, she says, you know, learning is messy. And it's so true. You know, we could probably sit here and just spend the whole time talking about everything we ever learned. We learned from children's picture books, right? Um, and, and the wonderful authors that have gifted us with those. So I think I think that's great. And I, and I hope that, you know, for those of you joining in today that you're being reminded of and maybe tweet out to us some of the titles that you use and that you love that help reach your kids in the same way, whether it's about any form of writing, reading, or thinking, because all of the above are, um, you know, what what we need to do to, to be reaching our kids. So, um, and I it's do not just learning that's messy; it's writing that's messy, which is why I always bring in my rough draft yeah, to show everything. kids. Because my my rough drafts are so so horribly messy, and when they're always like, oh my gosh, is that what you do? I mean, that's just awful. You can't read the handwriting. I mean, it's just, the, the sketches are just blobs. And the point is to show them that no one writes a perfect first draft. It's impossible. And to give them permission to make mistakes because mistakes are basically sometimes where the fun happens. When you let down your guard and see what comes out on the page, you might think like, wow, that's really something. I want to use that. And I didn't intend it, but it just came out. Because when you're trying to mold things, when you're just facing a blank page and you're trying to make it perfect, I think that's when people get writer's block because there is no perfect. You let yourself be messy, you can always come back and revise. And revision gives you permission. So it just take that as your permission to make a mess and have fun and explore and see what happens. I think a lot of first drafts are like, I think of it as like a plate of soup. There's just nothing there but blah, I just put it out there and then I'm going to carve it away. And I'm carving my soup, but you know, I'm mixing my metaphors. But I'm going to mold it up so it has more shape. You just let it B, and then you can find out what you have. But otherwise, you don't have anything. So you have to, I think kids want to be, they, they hit nine and they want to be perfect. And that's something like you just got to dissuade. There's no such thing as perfect. There's just messy and then making it better and better and better as you get closer to the image you have in your head. No one ever gets there. You just get closer. And adults are the same. The kids need to know that we, as adults, struggle with this. Professional writers, we struggle with this. We make messes. And when I tell them how many times I revise a book, I know they think, wow, she's a really bad writer because she needs to redo it so many times. But that's kind of what it takes. It just takes patience. See, now, for my friends who I'm going to ask after because I can't tweet as fast as I want to, do you not want to tweet every single thing that is coming out of Marissa's mouth? Or just get her to Skype in with your kids or bring her. Marissa's on the West Coast, which we neglected to say. Um, but when she is in New York, and we can't wait for her to be back again in New York. We have to get her into your classrooms because she is just so inspiring. And Marissa, you Skype too as long as we get the timing right, right? I do do right, Skype right? visits and I'll be at NCTE. Yeah. Yes, yes. And hopefully Absolutely. we'll have our little Wonderopolis um, and exciting thing with friends, wondering with friends. So, um, Anyway, um, I know I feel like the time is going so quickly, and I just I wanted to just share a few things that also inspire from Marissa's work. And one is from a book that is historical fiction, which I think is another important focus um, that we can then do and use with our kids. So I'm just going to throw this slide up real quickly, and then you can talk a little bit about it, Marissa. Um, mm -hmm. True Heart and the author's note, and a little bit about what that is. Do you want to share um, with everyone? Yeah. So, so I started. We started talking about this at the very beginning. Um, seeing this picture and then wondering who these women were. So that started me asking the questions and the frustrating thing was I couldn't find out anything about them. So I tracked down the curator of this exhibit and where she got the photo and she basically came up empty. She said, you know, I found this. I don't know anything about these women. I don't know who these women are, were, what they were doing. So then I had to ask myself, who could these women be? Who would these women be? And I knew where the photo was taken. It was taken in Wyoming. I knew the date of the photo. That was it. So then I had to ask questions about what were what was life like for a woman in the West at that time, turn of the century? What options did they have? And in fact, it's like you, you chip away, and it's hard because women aren't written about in general. Men are written about. But there are some pioneer diaries and journals that you can read. And I read as widely and deeply as I could. And then I found, OK, women were smart. At the West, they could do things. It gave them freedom to do things they couldn't do back East because there were fewer people. So women took advantage of this and took on these jobs that they wouldn't normally get. And if you go back to that photo, there's one woman in particular that I, I zoomed in on. She just has this great smile, and I thought, like, she's my main character. And she becomes Belle, who is the, the hero of True Heart, who starts loading freight and becomes a train engineer. Because I thought, well, if women could load freight, maybe one of them became an engineer. We just don't know. It could have happened. 
I just and put that's the story. picture back up for you, Marissa. Okay, because she's just got, I don't know if it's big enough that you can see, she's got this amazing face. She's got kind of a lock of blonde hair coming over her forehead, and she looks so uh -huh. impish and proud of herself. And I thought, okay, I'm empowering her a century and a half later and giving her her story. I and I think love if, that. And if kids look at, like, if they look at a photo like this and you say, okay, who is that character? Imagine that character. They can come up with a story behind that. That's human nature. We all read stories into faces. Who could that person be? And then go with it and see who she becomes or he becomes. That's a great segue to the, the next slide, which kind of translates that work into work that um, we're doing in the classrooms because I actually have two pieces of letters that were written to um, Abe Lincoln, fictional letters from kids um, for history, but I just, I really, I love the quote um, that comes above it, which is that facts are data and truth is the sense we make of that data. Okay. I, re I pulled that quote out of uh, Georgia Hurd's book, which when I stop sharing the slide, I will show you that as well, but these two letters I think are a perfect examples. These were sixth grade students that I work with, but um, the one on, I guess it would be the one that says, Dear Abraham Lincoln, let's start with that. And it's um, the voice in here. And again, knowing your story and knowing your history is one thing, but then to kind of think about putting yourself in that role um, for kids, they were internalizing this. And, and as Marissa said, having the opportunity to, to really express what they were learning. So, you know, I've been petrified about the war. I wish it will end soon. Now the slaves are free and fighting. I feel a little better. The soldiers must be horrified. I heard there's enough blood to fill an ocean. I want this war over. I want peace for all. Help them win this war. And another student, which I love this one because there's so many examples of how thoughtful and reflective this student was on, um, you know, changing every word to be the perfect word choice and how someone would sound during this time period. So, dear Abe Lincoln, Lee's acting a fool's role. He's planning on heading west. We can tell he ain't gonna get away with what he's done to all my good friends. Thank you, sir. You creating the Emancipation Proclamation. It will help us win now that we have more African Americans, thousands of them, enough to double our army. Please, sir, stay alive so you can help us win the war. Keep us alive. And look at the bottom. This student was so um, thoughtful and reflective, always loyal, and not just Daniel, but Daniel G. So that, you know, kind of fitting into, um, you know, what would be appropriate and what would be thoughtful for someone writing in that time period. And that was really after some studies looking at Marissa's work with the journals. And we didn't really talk a, a lot about the journals that you have um, in that personality and that persona, but do you want to speak to that at all, the journal writing that you do? Well, I mean, actually, jumping off of what you were just saying about the letters, what I love about that is it's not just writing, it's history. And that's my other passion besides writing is history, because history is basically stories that really happen. What could be better than that? And I think that the way history is taught tends to be a bunch of, a litany of names and dates, and it's really crushingly boring for kids. But this is a way of making it accessible and interesting, that they're role playing, that they're imagining what it would be like to be alive at that time and how they would feel, and then writing about it. So you basically marry two kinds of interesting intellectual explorations, history and writing. And I think that's a great way to get at both because, I mean, it's a win-win. You're kind of doubling down on getting both, you know, talked about and getting kids to think about history as stories that they can feel part of and then retell in their own voices or voices they've created like these students did at the time of Abraham Lincoln, which is, I think, fabulous. That I mean, and I use the journals, basically, when I do my historical journals, the whole point of using the journal format is to make history come alive to kids by making them look at what looks like an original document. Because to me, that's what's fascinating about history, going back in time and reading documents from that era, whatever era it was, instead of reading somebody's retelling or reimagining of it, seeing the original stuff and then feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm there. And that's what I want them to feel in a little snippet from any of the historical journals or even the picture book biographies is to make them feel like they're there at that time. And it's not some distant boring past. It's a story that they're part of for a little bit, for a little while, and they've incorporated it into their being. Because it's you, going back to what you said at the very beginning of this, it's reaching people's hearts. They feel it in their heart, in the pit of their stomach. I mean, they're worried about the war. That's powerful stuff. That's a, that's a way of learning that's visceral. You want kids to learn viscerally because then you really do learn it. It means something. It's not just a fact you remember for a test. You throw it out there and you forget about it the next day. Absolutely. Um, I know some people had questions for Marissa about Skype, and I think that we did answer them, but I can't believe how time flies when I'm talking with Marissa because she's just so wonderful, and I'm really honored and thrilled to be able to um, 
present with her at uh, various conferences and I had that opportunity and will continue to have that opportunity and I hope that if you um, were able to find out about some of her work today for the first time that you'll check out her books um, but really more importantly that you know just a takeaway might be thinking about how we can um, you know again focus on that literacy beginning in the heart and not just the head and yes. finding out what our kids are passionate about and celebrating that and giving them opportunities to expand on what's possible um, so many different wonderful things but you know putting a right the right book in the right you know at the right time in the hands of the reader just uh, makes magic happen so hopefully we gave you some food for thought today and um, I would welcome continued questions if you want to use the hashtag we have two people for books that are going to get books um, I thank Marissa for her time and her talents and I really really appreciate the fact that she was able to join us today so I look forward to uh, our next venture together um, adventure together Marissa <laughs> <laughs> it's always a pleasure. And uh, thank you to everybody who tuned in from the Ed Club. We look forward to learning with you and continuing the journey. So enjoy the rest of the day and the closings. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you.